Okay, let's have a few moments of silence before we begin. J. Baba. <clears throat> Hey, Baba. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, just to kind of give you the format, we um, <clears throat> we go through kind of sub chapter by sub chapter, and Angela will randomly pick somebody <clears throat> to read. You can also pass if you want. And uh, will you after reading, then people can chime in. <clears throat> um, or ask questions, anything at the end, and uh, feel free to do that. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to, one thing that I mentioned over the last couple of sessions is that, you know, Darwin in this book is giving, you know, uh, a number of the ways of following Baba, but there are <clears throat> many other ways uh, that he doesn't cover. Uh, you know, the Sufis say there are as many ways to God as there are individual souls. And I say this because one time we had a meeting here, Effort and Grace, <clears throat> uh, some years back, and one of the longtime caretakers of the center, who is very devoted to Baba and everything like that, so wonderful, <clears throat> he came. And at the end of the session that we had, he said, I don't know what you people are talking about. So, because his inner lo longing to serve and love Baba got translated into his outer life, and he had a, just a different way of doing it, and equally uh, devoted to Baba. So I just say that. This book is about, it's like conscious, uh, a working relationship with Baba as we move through the heart into the deeper realm of the heart, eventually to wind up at the soul, at the, at the soul level. <clears throat> and and, and um, eventually we'll get a few moments, sometimes a, a little bit more in which we as Darwin says, we merge for a little bit, a bit, a little bit with Baba. The heart is is not the destination. The heart is is a way station on to merging at, in the soul level with Baba. So anyway, that's that's kind of the that characterizes this uh, work. Um, do you think it would be good to have Farish Day read this office? Sure. Translation. The heart is the enclosure around his sacred love. The eye is the reflector of his matchless beauty. I will not bow my head to this world or the next. My neck is under the weight of his benediction. You are wishing for the tree of paradise and I am wishing for the friend's presence. Each person's thoughts reach as far as his efforts permit. The time of Majnoon has passed. It is now our turn. Every person is allotted only five days and no more. Who am I to deserve access to the intimate sanctuary of the beloved? The breeze protects and veils the sanctity of that inner sanctum. The kingdom of love and the treasure of happiness and bliss, whatever I have received is due to his will and blessing. What is there to fear if my heart and I are annihilated? The aim here is the protection of his vital presence. The seat of my eye is never without his presence because he has taken a private residence in this corner. It shouldn't be surprising that I should be a sinner. The entire world is witness to his purity. 
the blossoming of each new flower in the garden. The blossoming of each new flower in the garden is the result of the color and fragrance of his speaking. Don't just observe the outer poverty. Don't just observe the outer poverty. Hafiz's chest is filled with the treasure of his love. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Whew. Hey, Baba. Yeah, <clears throat> so appropriate to this book. We are reading from page 37 of the book. Sanskaric Potholes. It is a delicate undertaking to gain control of one's thoughts and feelings without any coercion at all. Effort, yes, but not coercion. It becomes a matter of seeing through the sanskaric complexes, which are based on an erroneous based on erroneous knowledge, beliefs, and limitations, and being resourceful enough to take evasive action. All this is in relation to one's own specific sanskaras. It is like going for a walk on a known route. We come to know the wet slippery areas, the potholes and where the route leads. The first few times we might make a mistake and fall into a pothole, but we soon get enough sense to walk on the other side of the road or choose a different place to step. When we have learned from experience where our sanskaras lead, we come to know that we have to redirect them early. After a while, we can see the beginning of the sanskaric pressures and start to counteract them at their earliest manifestation. It is like a railroad worker observing a train peacefully chugging along. Suddenly he notices a rogue train barreling down the same track from the opposite direction. He quickly throws a switch in order to divert this rogue train to a side track. Then he smiles as the first train, now out of danger, whizzes by. Then he smiles. Um, the first train represents truth. The rogue train represents ignorance due to our sanskaras. We can learn to take subliminal evasive action, to switch our train of thoughts and feelings at the first sign of impending trouble. We have to learn how to maneuver the mind so that we have more control, not willful repression, but, the re but a redirection of our energy so that we experience more inner freedom. Eventually, the thought patterns are no longer able to control us. Instead, they come under our control. This is not blind control because it is backed by understanding and subservience to truth itself. Gradually, we become aware that everything really is illusion and we become a channel of love, a river of love, an ocean of love. Ah, yes. I just have a question about what, what is meant and referred to by... Um, uh, we're controlled by our, our thoughts or controlled by our, our mind. Is it to say that the thoughts that come in are then we can't help ourselves, but, but play out those thoughts. So, um, you know, I'm feeling, I have had thoughts of, of gaining money. So then I can't help, but go out and act upon gaining money in a way that would be, you know, greedy as opposed to from a place that's open and free or, heart-centered. Is, is that the idea we're talking about here, or is there something more subtle than that? <clears throat> well, I mean, your, your thoughts, if they're <clears throat> being fed by your sanskaric desires, uh, they, they will uh, take you in a certain direction. And now you have a certain space there. Do I want to go in that direction and get disappointed? Or do, well, well for example, say suppose you, someone betrays you. And so you feel this uh, great resentment and, and there's the urge to kind of retaliate in some way. But then you know what retaliation does. It creates a, a, another s emotional mess for you. So you kind of move toward forgiveness 
as you know, you redirected that, you redirected this rogue train that's coming <clears throat> that wants to express itself. Uh, you, you, you take, take the other impulse that's deeper in you and live, live uh, that out. Go with that. Does that make sense? Sure. Yes, that does make sense. <clears throat> and there are thoughts and emotions that come through. Some of them are based on love and some of them are based on selfishness. So you have a, a choice there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Changing our values. If we take even one step, and we all know one step we could be taking right now, we begin to experience a little light and a little more of reality. After we take two or three steps, and then more steps, we see more and more light, and we begin to realize that we have been in a dream all along. It takes a lot of deep inner working to weed out desires, give up our misconceptions and overcome our false sense of limitation. To ferret these things out and boldly and daringly kick them out of our consciousness. However, it is not that we let go of all these impediments and get nothing in return. There is no permanent void created when we let go. Rather, a process of change takes place or should take place. Meher Baba speaks through the discourses and elsewhere about letting go of the limitations of our ego life in favor of the master's unlimitedness. It is not that we merely let go of the limitations, but that we receive and fully accept the unlimitedness of the truth. Therefore, we find that it is not feed it is not a feeling of loss that we experience, but a sense of gaining some measure of inner freedom and fulfillment. Meher Baba is willing, even eager, to share his unlimited life with us. When we were with him physically, this was one of the most glorious things that we experienced, sharing in his infinite beauty and sweetness and indescribable freedom. I'll tell you one little thing that happened with some of us. I think Erwin might want to say something after me. But <clears throat> when we were living up near Darwin and Jean, this is back in the early 70s, and you know, we were young and we set about to give up lust, greed, anger, dishonesty, fear, and all of that. <clears throat> and we and it left us feeling quite empty. And uh, you know, like he mentions in this thing about feeling a void, and we said, Darwin, it's we're, we're trying to give this stuff up, but we're, it, it feels kind of unsettling. And we're, and Darwin made this gesture from, I don't know if you can see it, but he said, you know, don't forget, behind the emptiness is his fullness. And he, and he just moved his hands from his heart and filled us, you know, with the fullness that you, that we get in exchange. For, for emptying out. So, I mean, that uh, he had an ability just to kind of, in a very, just a natural way of just making a gesture like that and it could hit your heart and fill it. So, <clears throat> you know, those who are have trouble with alcohol, <clears throat> you can feel horrible and empty as you're giving it up. But meanwhile, you're getting an inner freedom that's awakening that makes it worth going through such uh, suffering and misery. Yeah. The thing that uh, I'd like to say about this is that um, it was really hard to worry about yourself around Baba. <laughs> it was, I mean, you know, all the problems that everybody has, how am I going to get rid of lust, greed, anger, fear, resentment, all the negative attributes. Well, Baba was interested in getting rid of your positive attributes as well. It wasn't just the attribute, all attributes had to go. <laughs> because before the mind can be cleaned of all of its limitations, its impressions, I should say, it's like they all have to, they all have to be taken away. And that's why whether a person was the greatest of sinners or the greatest of saints, 
it didn't matter at all to Mayor Baba who and what you thought you were or what you uh, experienced because he had to eliminate all of that in order to clear you so that you could actually see the true self that you are, which is unlimited and infinite and, and is exactly what he experiences. Baba wanted to take you to his experience. He wasn't interested in keeping you in your experience, especially since you wanted to advance to, uh, uh, in consciousness. So he had to, uh, so, so people come to him and with all kinds of problems. But the truth of the matter is, his mission was to remove uh, all your sense carriers, all your impressions that caused all your problems. And <laughs> so how was it when, how was it when you, let me yeah. say this. Yeah. Uh, he, it's not like he wasn't interested in helping you. Oh yeah, he would help you no matter what kind of problem you had. But at the same time, that was not his mission. His mission was to reveal his true self and to reveal your true self. And this was all that there was to it. It wasn't a, a big problem for him at all. It was the easiest thing because one that has infinite knowledge, infinite power, infinite bliss, what is he to worry about? <laughs> he can free others. That's the whole point of his being in the world is to free everybody. So all we could do is focus on him. Think about him. Uh, you, you can be doing the things that you're doing just on this uh, website. Uh, but the whole point was to remember him and to think about him and to focus on him because he represented in his awareness everything that you will ever achieve. You want to achieve self-realization, self-knowledge, self-experience of what you truly are. You don't want to be limited forever. It's like the chicken and the egg. The chicken is uh, very important that the egg is there. It evolves and develops its body. But then once it's uh, done with the making of the body, it wants to get out of that shell. It doesn't want to stay bound and limited. Mm -hmm. And our shell is the mind, <laughs> the limitations of the mind, which creates the imagination that we get absorbed in and which they, we think is real. Well, anyhow, that's the way he explained it. Now, uh, to actually do that, is what everybody wants to know. Uh, how do you do this? Well, he said it in one way. He said, just keep remembering me. The more you remember me, the less you remember yourself, the less you remember everything else that's happened. So remember me and things will begin to fall into place as it should be in a natural manner. So this is what I have to say. Uh, now it's said. <laughs> Fantastic. No, that's everything. Beautiful. Wow. I just loved hearing Erwin. Thank you so much. That uh, talking about Baba was so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, uh, I get what, what Darwin is saying, at least the way I interpret it, you know, that I need to focus my mind, blah, 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 blah. But honestly, I don't think I can think myself out of a paper bag with my own sanskaras. That, so for me, and, and it really does dovetail what Erwin said, is that when I notice the thinking's not right, I have, to, I have to think about Baba. Because Baba can do it. I don't think I can do it. And, and I think Baba says this. I can't quote anything. But, um, you know, like, I'm not going to be able to solve my own problems. So I have a little bit of a challenge with this reading, you know, that I should, you know, think in a different way. But, I mean, I know Darwin was, like, so focused on Baba. Um, you know, maybe if I was like a saint like Darwin, I could do it too. But um, personally, when I have a challenge, I just need to go to Baba. When I notice a challenge, I need to go to Baba. So that's, that's my experience. I, I can't solve it myself. Thank you. Yeah, good. And that's very much what Erwin was saying. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I say something? Yeah. Um, Baba says, if you make me your real father, all your problems will become dissolved in my ocean of love. So I believe that. Um, he has helped me incredibly. And you know what? When I notice something that's coming up from my dark side, from the way, way 
deep past that should have been let go already. I'm like, oh, Lord, Father, I'm so different. This is amazing, and it's still there. I took it back again. So then <laughs> I realized, start loving Baba. Forget it. Go to Baba and get into a place in your heart of loving Baba. And he t it's gone. It's sure. like when you're in your present moment, you're not thinking you're in the present moment. That's why sometimes too much talking, talking, talking. It's like in the present moment, you're in the present moment. <laughs> and Baba takes over and he does everything. Uh, Daniel Stone. Yeah, Jeff, I, I just want to ask you, um, the very first sentence in this from Darwin, he says, if we take even one step, and we all know one step we could be taking right now, we begin to experience a little light and a little more of reality. I'm just curious from your point of view, Jeff, and others too, um, what, like, when I read that, I don't necessarily, um, I don't immediately generate a step I could be taking right now. So I'm not sure that I'm quite clear about what, what he's talking about when he's talking about there's a step that's clear to us that we could be taking right now. So can you offer us <clears throat> your perspective on that? Yeah, um, well, let's see if someone else can uh, come in there first. Anyone? Um, <clears throat> I do know that at any moment, we can, there's a there's a, a a line that Baba gave me. In every moment, there's something loving that can be done. Uh, just you know, look around. There's, in other words, there's even if it's just saying Baba's name or centering Baba in this moment, there is there is a next step. <clears throat> uh, it could be calling somebody that you've had a conflict with and trying to resolve it. I mean. I do feel that there is something that we can do uh, that's loving and meaningful in even in this very moment for each of us. I mean, that's just my, my feeling that, uh, so that we're not just kind of spinning our wheels. Um, <clears throat> but anyone else uh, to respond to that? Uh, Damien had his hand up before you asked the question, but That's not yeah, okay. I okay. have a question, but just to say something about what Daniel said. I mean, you could, we could, we could all make like a list of things that uh, would be steps of healthy, loving things we could do each day. Like Jeff is saying, like reach out to someone, or I don't know. But I actually had a question about about what it says you know, to take your um, weed out desires and give up misconceptions and overcome false sense of limitations. Does anybody have any suggestions on how to turn those over to Baba, your desires, your misconceptions, and so, so that he can work with our consciousness and how to turn that over to him? I mean, it's easy to just say, give it to Baba, you know, give it to Baba, but that's, that's not easy to do. We say it all the time, but does anybody have like a step-by-step -step process maybe that they can share? Well, one thing, one thing that I do, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not, whenever I uh, go to say, write a letter or go to do something, I always think that it's Baba who is getting it done through me. And that, and so, and whatever it is, if I, and that's my goal is to, to do that with everything, which of course, uh, and so that he would be the doer totally and good and bad. So I think just that awareness of, of Baba uh, actually being the one that does the good and the bad. I, I think that Baba says something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, anyway. that's helpful. That's a good reminder. Thank you, Billy. Because like, I used to years ago, I would say like, good thoughts, good words, good deeds, you know, the Zoroastrian good thoughts, good words, good deeds. I would try to start each day with like that. But it should be like Baba thoughts, Baba words, Baba deeds. 
just always think Baba is doing. So then we're turning it to him and less, less of us, more of him. For me, uh, and what the, exactly what you just said in, as your response to Billy was, Bob is doing all of this anyway. And our ability lies in knowing we're a set, remembering <clears throat> the Baba is, is, is us. And we want more of the Baba out of us, coming out of us, and less of the identity or the soul drop claiming the words, claiming the deeds, doing this. So I think Billy's got the right idea. And I think Baba gave us this. Baba <clears throat> says, me be doing all this through you. Let me be, the more of him that comes out, the better we are. And, and it's a process, I really believe, of witnessing the conditioned pattern, patterns of the limited self. And it's from the chapter we just read, how do we let go? How do we identify what... Darwin is asking us to do, Baba actually does it. I don't think we're the ones that do it. All we do is put the effort forward to love him, to say his name, and more of him comes out by doing that, is what I believe. So, dear Baba. Let, let me interject. Uh, that's plan A that Patty and some of you were talking about. Plan B, which is what I've done and, and many of us, is... <clears throat> You, you can't just give this stuff to Bob, it's still there. But what, Dar what I gather from Darwin from early days is you focus on the, com the emotional complex or the limitation, the binding that you have at the heart level, and you imagine yourself giving that to Baba, who is right in front of you. Give that to him. And, he, and Darwin would say that Baba is impressionless being he's like an ocean so you you give him what your the, the emotion the congestion that's in you to bob right. but it's only one layer at a time just behind that is another layer that looks just like the 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 layer you gave him but it was a very it's a very slow process in which you unload these concerns and limitations in oneself to bob and and Erich, I remember Erich saying that spiritual progress, he said, is very, 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 very gradual. Four, four varies. I counted them. So it's there's a slow kind of releasing of these things. Uh, if you can't just go uh, to Baba and get it all dissolved in one shot, this particular thing you're going through, then it is a slow bit by bit giving to Baba, surrendering it. And eventually, a lot of these things that were complexes that bothered us for years start to diminish and one day they kind of go. So that's plan B. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tina had her hand up. Yeah. I, you know, I've been trying this whole self-improvement game for years, <laughs> all these different books and stuff and trying to think positive, but actually, I don't know if I've really improved at all. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, you know, Pema Chodron said, you know, that's like uh, a losing game, this self-improvement game. Um, and, you know, being in the epicenter of coronavirus here and being afraid to go outside and all that, um, it, it, it's just ramping up the, um, the anxiety and I feel like I'm kind of back at square one and um, I don't see the end game in this and I'm having a hard time trusting. So all I can do is reach out to other people and see how they're doing. And I have, um, you know, I've been able to come up with some money. And um, I, so I have uh, little flower arrangements sent to people or I have food delivered to them, you know, and I, I just give them that as a gift. So that kind of um, is a way to connect with you know, because he did say real happiness lies in making 
others happy. Yeah. And it is, um, it is a, a, I would recommend that. And just even a phone call to say, hi, how you're doing? Because um, a lot of people are, are really struggling with this up here. And uh, so, you know, I guess I don't think I'm really that much more self-improved than I ever was. I'm still the same person. <laughs> and I think you are, Tina. I've I've seen you over the years for many years. You you you're you're seeing yourself up close, but <clears throat> you know. Well, thank you, Bob Jeff. Been doing a lot of work in you, and you're. There's a line from Rumi where he says, you're so obsessed with the bad stitching on your sleeve that you fail to see the magnificence of your own garment. Oh, that's a good line. Yeah, I guess, you know, because yeah. I'm just mired in anxiety now over this yeah. whole situation. Yeah. I, I feel like, oh, I'm back at square one. Yeah, just <laughs> anything else here. Yeah, Gail had her hand up. Uh, Jay Baba, um, going back to Kate's question, um, what I've done to be concrete, um, sometimes I guess the plan A is to sit down and I need to be calm and quiet because that's when Baba comes to me. Baba's always here, but if I'm not calm and quiet, that's I can't connect. And once there, even though I often don't exactly believe it, I, I literally say the words, Baba, I need help with this thing. I need help with that thing. Um, so I'm specific about um, whatever is going on. And another way, and that's one way of um, surrendering what the problem is and connecting to Baba with it. Um, and the other thing I do is I have a Baba box or a Baba can. Um, and the reason I have a can sometimes is, is that Baba can do everything. And so I'll put my trouble or my sanskara or my weakness and I'll put it in the can and I'm physically putting, giving it to Baba. So sometimes doing something physical like writing on a piece of paper and doing that. So that's a couple of things that I've done in terms of concrete. Yeah. Good. Great. <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> and Gabriella? Well, so much has happened since I first pruned my hand, but uh, this is a little out of context, but I, I did want to say this one thing um, that Jeff had mentioned right at the beginning about behind the emptiness is the fullness. Um, and it reminded me of Vareshta's poem about the heart contains, the heart is the outer covering that it's not, it's a, it's, and then it was like, you said, Jeff, the heart is a way station towards the destination. It is not the destination. I think that's a, um, cause I do a lot of work of my own personal sense of the heart. And actually we, we read this bit about the free flow of energy in the heart a few times ago that Darwin mentioned about flow, the flow in the heart. The, and so I've been working a lot with that, been aware of that. And I'll, take uh, the pain and put it into the, the heart and let it be dissolved or explode or do whatever it wants to do in there. And, and that helps me. Um, and one more quote technique, if you will, that I've been, that's been helping me is I'll take whatever it is I want to give to Baba and I want to put it at his feet, but it feels like it's just all wiggly and this and that. So that doesn't work. So I put it in a box. <laughs> And I put that at his feet. And each thing I give him has a different shape. Sometimes it's a diamond shape. Sometimes it's a, a oval or whatever. But that somehow concretizes it for me. I can give it to him and I know he receives it. So those are just a few random. Beautiful. Thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. These are all great ways. <clears throat> and Duke. Yes, yeah, still in response to uh, Kate's question. We all know that the, the mind plays a lot of tricks on us because Baba tells, <laughs> tells us that it does. And it, the mind can be very misdirecting. And one of the ways it seems to me that the mind misdirects us is that it leads us to think that we can be very willful, willful about our own individual desires, and what we want to happen. 
Um, when in reality, it seems to me that Baba was trying to tell us again and again that what has to happen will happen. And we have to be reminding ourselves that what has to happen will happen. To the extent that we're exerting some sort of effort, I think we have to see that effort as not being a way to exercise our individual will, but rather a way to help Baba do his work. And if we remember that, I think, then it takes a load off of us to some extent, or at least it unburdens us a little bit more. Excellent. Uh, an exchange process. Letting go of limitations requires not only paying attention to our thoughts and feelings and the illusory forces we allow ourselves to be swayed by. It also requires examining our values, especially at subjective levels, and exchanging relative or false values for more real values. We are working toward truth from a position of ignorance and falsehood. So it becomes a matter of a gradual exchange, exchanging one little aspect of falsehood for some aspect of truth. At each step along the way, the play of imagination lessens. We exchange something that is grossly ignorant for something that is less ignorant, less gross, and a little more real. And sometimes, with Baba's grace, we may even catch glimpses of reality itself. We have to go through this process because our values are mixed up with our desires. And the desires create a sort of delusive coloring over our values, which distorts them. In other words, we have a tendency to try to add truth to our desired nature, thus preserving our false self. So we have to sort out the truth or real values from the distorted values of the desired nature. The desires, of course, have to be outgrown or cast aside, but not repressed. In lieu of repression of desires, we can make good use of their energy by transforming and sublimating it into longing for God, longing for reality. For the aspirant, this is a natural and most desirable way of proceeding, sublimating energies for, from desires that are seen to lead only into illusion and bondage, the bondage of the soul. Thus, little by little, little our mental consciousness undergoes a change. This is the gradual reconstitution process that Meher Baba refers to in the discourses. Since, as Baba says, all finiteness and limitation is subjective and self-created, it is in our own hands to work at subjective levels, especially the heart level, to correct what is false and replace it with the real. Very condensed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, so like an example of this would be like if I'm experiencing lust to replace the focus of that desire of lust for, for my longing for Meher Baba. So like almost like a direct image overlay of one person with Meher Baba or if it's, you know, the desire for money to replace from from a greedy place, I suppose, rep uh, replacing that desire to possess with then the desire to possess with Baba. So like overlaying Baba's image or overlaying laying Baba's, my sense of Baba onto that thing that I'm desiring, so to speak. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. And and you can't necessarily go to the the highest ideal. You may have to go from being uh, stingy to a little less stingy. <laughs> you know what I mean? You may have to work it up gradually. Uh, you know, what, what your next step is, as far as preferring the lower value of selfishness to uh, the values that are uh, fed by love. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, beautiful. Any other, I know Daniel, you asked about what, where are these values, these higher values coming from? You know, um, 
mention, I, I'm singling out D uh, Daniel Stone, that we're replacing lower values with higher values. What, what is your take on that? What is my take on it? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, it's, it seems to me that um, I mean, this, this issue of values is, is a really interesting one and the way he's using it to me. Because it's to me, the higher values is the longing for God and it's the longing for Bob and the longing for union. And it's, and the lower values are all about separation. And so, you know, it seems to me what he's saying is we get caught up in our separative thinking and our separative desire, you know, our desires that drive our separative thinking. And that's, you know, and at some point we, we need to sort of, a lot, Darwin's whole emphasis to me is about awareness of these patterns when they occur. I mean, I, I hear everything that people are saying about giving things to Baba directly. And I think that's beautiful and it's wonderful and that's clearly the right way to go. But I feel like Dar Darwin's talking about the inner process of being aware of, of how one's own inner, you know, inner process generates these, these feelings and, and watching them happen so that when they happen and I can feel okay, this is like, like I was in a, in a situation the other day where I could feel welling up in me a response to somebody, you know, for something they had done or said that, that was offensive to me and, and saying, okay, I can either, and then once I was aware of that reaction, I'm at the precipice of action and I can either choose the lower value of getting revenge or getting, you know, you know backbiting or whatever it is, or somehow I can breathe into that, let it go, and somehow allow a higher value to emerge of, let, let me try to understand where that person might be coming from. Let, let me try to be empathic with them. Let me, you know, let me remember Baba and sort of see if I can bring love into the situation. It seems to me that that's the kind of process he <clears throat> talked about, you know, when he talks about values. It's not like truth and justice in the American way kind of values. He's, I think he's talking about that core of sep you know, separation versus unity. That's, that's my take. Yeah, on. well said. Excellent. I think that's exactly what Darwin is talking about. <clears throat> I think of the problem of valuation. There's a discourse where Baba actually talks about it. And he talks about right valuation. And he talks about uh, that we shouldn't be making distinctions between big things and little things. And um, I, I was trying to find it in the discourses, but I haven't found it yet. But I'll keep looking. And um, but he specifically addresses the issue of valuation in the discourses. Yeah. It's in the infinity of the truth, I think, in a volume uh, one. But <laughs> okay. Oh, Jeff has his hand up. Go ahead, Jeff Asbell. I remember reading that Baba said, "Treat the ego." like a football that gets beat up in all those rugby games. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking and listening to what everybody's saying. And I think we've all tried many times in many ways to let go, get out of the way of the ego. And when I'm thinking of beloved Baba's words, the ego must be beaten like that football it's about a 90% quote. I think I'm saying, I just have to whatever's thrown at me, just take it like that expression, like a man, like a woman, I'm looking for the exact right words, but you just got to take it. Yeah, we get offended. Somebody will say something that really is insensitive. And really the unconscious message I think is how you, you, you can't say that to me. <laughs> I'm important. Not only can you not say that to me, but the unconscious is saying I'm important. How dare you say that to me? And the truth of the matter is nobody's important. We all think we're somebody. I think Bob is trying to encourage us to be nobody. And it takes a lot of time to be, to be nobody or nobody special. And I'm saying to myself, when I get, some of those ego blows by whatever, 
I'm just going to allow myself to be beaten like a football and just sort of like be like an empty jacket that a baseball bat hits. Only I'm feeling it. I'm a human being. I have feelings. But I think I'm going to just try for a day from now till tomorrow night. Whatever is said that sort of is like, you know, I heard a Zen master once say, become uninsultable. Unassailable? Uninsultable. Oh, uninsultable, yeah. Become uninsultable. I think Bob is saying even better, be like a football. It gets beat up. It gets thrown on the football field. It gets pummeled. It's going to happen to you too. Just don't take it seriously. I'm going to try to do that because, you know, I've tried like all of us. And some of these things may work. You can breathe out. You can call on Baba's name. And some of this may be beautiful and effective. I think I'm just going to take it as it comes and not take it seriously. It's, um, if you have anything that can elucidate that or enhance that, Jeff or Angela or anybody, I would appreciate that. Yeah, anyone to uh, respond to <clears throat> what Jeff is saying there? Yeah, I was actually raising my hand before uh, Jeff's question. So, but I was trying to say that in terms of um, in situations where I have confusion or uh, where I have to val evaluate uh, the right values, I yeah. always remember Baba's message, learn the art of taking the stand on truth within. And when I remember that and I ask myself, what is the truth in this situation? I know that helps a lot because the truth is within ourselves and we can uh, clearly see that uh, either the situation or the value properly when we remember that. Very good. Yeah, sometimes we have to defend not our tr ourself, but the truth. So it looks like we're defending ourself, but we're actually defending the truth. You know, if somebody is cruel toward us, uh, we may defend the truth that this is not the way you treat a fellow being. You're not defending yourself, you're defending love. So that's that's another option there. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, thank you. Thank you both yeah. very much. Judy Robertson. Yes. Um, this is in response to what um, not Jeff Wolverton. I don't know Jeff uh, Aspels. No. Um, um, Jeff, when you were saying um, not to take things seriously. Um, what um, came up in my mind or heart was what Baba said um, to take God seriously and life lightly. <laughs> and I've, I've found that really helpful to me um, so many times over the years that um, anyway, I just thought I would remind us of that lovely quote of Baba's. Yeah. Thank really you. kind of keeping Thank things you. in perspective. And I think in, in particular at this time with the coronavirus and sort of the, seri the potential seriousness of what so many people, all of us in one way or another are dealing with, um, taking God seriously, I find really helpful in balancing, you know, that this life stuff to take it a little more lightly. Also responding to Jeff Espel, um, I think in my life, the times I've been very often most moved is when I am around somebody and I observe that um, way of being. It's so hard for me to do that. I have such an easy, I'm always, um, I feel like I have to, I've had to learn to stand up to my, for myself in this life. Um, but there is, something so beautiful about that way of being, I think of Erich, um, but it maybe it is interesting, like being beat about by the football, but like Jeff uh, Wolverton said, you're standing up for the truth within could mean at times, you know, no, you should wear that mask. 
you know, I'm telling you, you need to be wearing a mask or, or it could mean, you know, um, you're being cruel to me and I won't put up with that. That's not okay because it's, you know, whatever, or you're being cruel to that little girl that I see or whatever it is that you, so there's a time to speak up, but I definitely, it's somebody put in the comments, isn't that what Jesus said about turning the other cheek? And because it's so far from my capacity, I find it extremely moving when I've seen people in, in my life do that. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's the, <clears throat> I know these are all situations that we face, you know, every day or at least <laughs> every week, these very ticklish situations and how to come up with the counter response that leaves us loving and free, free minded, you might say. Okay, what about the inner barometer? This is a, this is a very valuable subchapter because he calls it an inner barometer and Erich used to call it, uh, 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 everyone has a gadget. He would refer to it as a gadget, but that inner barometer. I've been taking this year more than any other time things that people say or an encounter I may have and one I may not even understand or it seems unpleasant but or it could be wonderful but I'm taking everything that comes my way as Baba is behind it and may be speaking through to me but it doesn't mean that what that person is saying per se but I'm opening up some area in in me and it's it may take a, a while for it to digest, to feel what, and I often do now, feel what Baba was trying to personally tell me. And that's just been some, a, a little voyage I've had. Mm -hmm. And interesting things, even a doctor in an office. I went in and I, I had no idea. I was thinking, why would he even be saying this? I didn't come in for this. Well, four or five months later, what he, was, he said, had something to do with what I needed. And that's, you know, to take yeah. it. But anyways, I'm now looking for, to, uh, to glimpse at that communication. And it can come in any direction from the voice of anyone else. Great attitude, beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so the inner barometer. The individual has to determine what makes or fortifies veils over his or her own consciousness. At least we know from Baba's explanations what the goal is. And we can do a great deal towards helping our spiritual unfoldment since we know what we are heading and what we must do and not do in order to make progress. We are conscious of what is going on within us, or we can be. We all have an inner barometer that tells us what darkens or lightens the heart and lifts or dissolves the veils. And we can check the barometer while things are happening within us. If whatever we are doing gives us a feeling of light so that we can see more deeply within, and have more spiritual insight, we know we are on the right track. But if our thoughts, words, or deeds make things more cloudy, more obscure and limited, we can see that something is trying to keep us bound to the gross level of consciousness and that this is not to our advantage spiritually. So it's not a matter of reading books and going by certain exterior morals or formulas, but what we actually experience within our own self, our own consciousness. In other words, we can read our own experiences. We make choices as to what we think, say, and do. And insight gained from the good or bad consequences are those choices, of those choices guides us we can discover the right course to take all the time. We need to value the insight and inner strength that come to us through clearing away the veils. 
Mayor Baba says that more inner wisdom will be revealed to us in accordance with our fidelity to insight we have, the insight we have. In other words, by respecting uh, whatever insight we have and living by it, putting it into practice instead of ignoring it for pleasures or whatever else would preoccupy our consciousness, we will gain more insight. But if we continuously, continuously make bad choices, we make it harder for higher, for higher insights to be revealed to us. All these all things, oh, I'm sorry, all these things vary with the individual, and we have to experiment with the concepts we have. I mean, I think people have had enough experience with their intuition, that inner barometer to know there are certain situations that seem uh, <clears throat> not a great place to be, and uh, or a certain actions that feel liberating and certain actions uh, seem to bind us. Uh, I mean, if anybody has an example uh, of that, uh, <clears throat> feel free to share. Jack had his hand raised before you asked that question. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, on, on the involution of consciousness, which there's no doubt that all of us sharing all of this information from Darwin have. There's, there is one aspect of it that, in my opinion, is the most important, at least for me, is not to have any expectations on anything that you do in any day that, or night that you do it. Because for, for me, uh, we're being taken into, you know, the deepest involution of consciousness uh, that, we, that we can't even imagine. So uh, it's a matter of just, you know, relaxing, relaxing into it. There's no, no point fighting it. It's going to happen. When it happens, it'll happen at the, at the time that's appointed for you, for me, for us. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah no expectations makes life a lot easier, for sure. Right before the meeting started, when Ferris Day was reading the poem, I got a call from a friend and I took it. And I missed the poem and I felt like I was I felt sticky during it. And she was very upset about something. And I thought, Baba, what just happened? And what came to me was that I continually disrespect my devotion by diverting my attention. It's not just about Baba. It's my own devotion. I'm disrespecting my life path and what I have just know to be true within for the diversions, the hurts, like to be insulted is to disrespect my devotion to what I know to be true. I have the great blessing of the avatar and the grace in this forum and the books and everything I've always wanted. And then in that last paragraph, um, Darwin says that um, we need to, in other words, by respecting whatever insight we have and living by it, putting into practice instead of ignoring it for pleasures, for whatever pleasures is like to prove that someone's wrong in my particular examples or whatever else would preoccupy our consciousness, we will gain more insight. So I think that respect for us as Baba as coming towards, and that's been, been feeling like, Oh, it's really just about me respecting my devotion to God and by the grace of God, of course. Anyhow, that's what I want. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. And Jeremy? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, Cindy, what you said resonated with me a lot. And um, I've been experiencing that often recently, especially with the coronavirus and everything and our lives slowing down in certain respects. Um, 
I think I've become aware of how distracted I allow myself to be and also like certain, and now that that's not possible in as much of a physical way of being like physically busy, I just notice it happening still in my mind a lot. Like even coming to an RT or some other Baba Zoom meeting that I really want to come to, but then also still feeling the urge to check my email or to do other things. And, and for me, I think, and it, it happens in other aspects of my life too. And I think like, Jeff, when you were asking for an example of, from this passage, I just think like, for me, it's like, like lust is a really good example of that, that like you were aware of how doing lustful actions or things like that make you feel, but it can be hard to not do it anyway. And for me, like, what I've come to think about it or how I've come to think about it is that it's like a lack of trust for Baba that not doing the things that you know to make you feel bad, like, or not trusting your inner barometer is like not trusting Baba. Um, and so I've just been trying to ask Baba for more trust to like take that leap of faith and not do what is comfortable or or like go my own way in a sense. Um, and like stepping into that sort of like very scary unknown is terrifying because Baba isn't here with us physically really, you know, I mean, he is, but it's not like having like a person here. So like trying to trust Baba, I feel like is like the hardest thing to do in the world um, for me. <laughs> but I think it's also like the only thing that we have to do in the world. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, very touching, Jeremy. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'll, let me mention one thing that, that Darwin uh, gathered and he stressed is, <clears throat> you know, if you think of Baba as a judge, as some Christians do, then he'll be a judge. <clears throat> if you think of him as a loving, forgiving mother, <clears throat> he'll be that for you. Or if you want a, a, him as a supportive father, he'll be that for you. If we can expand who Baba is. We can have him in our own room. He could be sitting on the couch there just opposite us. If, if we expand to not, not limit him by his even physical presence and his personal interest in us, you know, hour by hour, day by day. And so... Uh, I'm just, Darwin is very, um, very encouraging on expanding who Baba is because in the end we'll see, realize he was all, had been all of that all along. He'd been, we'd been, he'd been right there watching us adoringly the entire time, but we may not find that out, you know, experientially until much later. But <clears throat> he is, Otherwise, where do you put him? Where, where is he? Is he off, you know, somewhere? He, he passed on and he's kind of just a blanket kind of love for everybody or is he personally there with us? I mean, that's, that's what Darwin, and, and, you know, <clears throat> really encouraged. Think that he's there with you and there's nothing you could do that would really cause him to look away. Yeah. You know. It's that personal, yeah. Yeah, oh, how sweet. Janet Jacobs. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what people see as the difference between the sanskaras and the veils. Someone wanna answer that? Uh, well, there was another hand up before that question. Uh, Judy, you wanna? Um, actually, yeah, my response was to Jeremy, um, statement, um, when you said that to not trust my inner barometer is to not trust Baba, I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, at least for me, um, that, that it really, I, I, 
in a way, I think I could um, put my entire life of spiritual aspiration into um, two words, trust Baba, um, that that's been what I've needed to learn and still need to learn my entire life more and more and still yet more. And I notice that every time I veer away, it, um, it get, I get myself in trouble. It's because I'm not trusting him enough. I'm not, um, you know, it's like if I really trusted him, I would literally worry about absolutely nothing because I would realize that whatever my master does is of the highest benefit for all concerned, which includes me and everybody else. And so it's all good. And yet I manage again and again to stumble into my uh, sort of rut in my personal road of sanskaras, which is lack of trust in Baba. Um, and, and that could also be applied to my own inner intuitive sense, my inner barometer. Um, and at any rate, so thank you for that comment, Jeremy. And yeah, beautiful, others. Judy. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and Jack, go ahead. Yeah, to me, it's the uh, putting yourself as the drop soul in the ocean and you're, you're contained within that, that bubble. And uh, it's the, for me, it's the amount of pressure I put on breaking the bubble that makes the difference. Uh, you know, between the sanskaras and, and the veil. That the bubble, the bubble, the bubble itself is the veil. And you're inside the veil, and your object is to get outside the veil or, or dis, displace the bubble and be, you know, become the ocean, the ocean itself. And it just depends on the amount of pressure that you put on it. That's all. Yeah. I, you know, just going back to what Janet Jacob said, I, I, I think that the, the the veil, the sun scars are bands of veils around us. They're kind of one and the same, but they they take they're like <clears throat> they're like huge complexes of of sun scars that take the form of different veils that that keep us from seeing. They're like clouds, uh, sun scary clouds that block the sun. I mean, that's my feeling, yeah. Mm. They're just the patterns that, that sanskaras take. Over our uh, yeah. Daniel Stone had something to say about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was gonna say something very similar to what Jeff said. I, I mean, these, these are just metaphors, of course, but I think of the veil um, as being sort of the mode you know, it's like, it's, it is the pattern. It's like a, and the, I think of the sanskaras as being the threads that make up this, the pattern. So, you know, we, we may be veiled by sort of, we may have a veil of anger or a veil of, um, you know, greed or a veil of resentment or a veil of like that. And it has lots and lots of different sanskaric, sanskaras that make that up and we can work our way through it th thread by thread. And as we do, then gradually the pattern starts to dissolve like that. That's, that's sort of how I see the relationship between the two. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think this idea, though, of the inner barometer is a nice way of, of just kind of uh, uh, capturing that part of us <clears throat> where we can kind of steer our way through uh, this melodrama and uh, <clears throat> and you get a sense of how I mean, if you spend an afternoon backbiting somebody I mean I can feel 
the cloudiness. I mean, I, I can feel the heaviness that that I'm that I've put myself into. So thank God we have something. Baba says the intuition is always a hundred percent correct. Our problem is accessing it, but it is correct in that. That's I do think that's the barometer. If we can clear clear it up so that it actually works, like Darwin says, you can kind of know uh, very much how how a situation, uh, it, it, how how it is affecting you, whether it's lifting you up, whether it's bringing you down, what you might have to do to lift your spirits. Uh, anyway, it's it, it's invaluable. Uh, that we have this inner barometer with Baba. Yeah. And Farishta, go ahead. Um, I'll just uh, comment um, that I, it uh, reminded me of the first time I came to Baba and met this Baba lover in uh, Iran, Mehrain. And uh, he said many things to me, but one of the things that really kind of should have stuck and it must have had its impact was he always said um, no matter what it is you're doing think it's baba doing it um you know if you're drinking tea say to yourself baba is drinking tea if you're talking on a zoom screen to others think it's baba talking on a zoom screen to others on a zoom screen that are also babas and uh, really just kind of um, remind myself of that often. I try to, that it is really Baba doing it. There is no real existence of me. And therefore the, re the truth is him and he is doing it because there's nothing else. The other stuff is of the stuff of illusion. So, um, the, uh, and, and the fact that we are, in his net all of us lucky ones are in his net um you would think that he's actually doing the work he is doing the work of bringing us to him we can't do it he's doing the work and to trust in the fact that he is the one doing the work in us to bring us closer in his measure in his timing without you know, without overwhelming us with illumination suddenly, uh, which will result in, you know, probably dropping the body. So he is working with us and through us and in us already. So we just have to remember that he, the work is being done, whether or not we are aware of it. That's, yeah. that's all I have to say. Uh, see, I call that plan A. <laughs> you know, but there's... Plan B, which is getting in there, you and Baba working together to kind of free up the interior. So, There's yeah. no choice but to do that. I mean, that he prompts that. But by the mere fact that we are aware, yeah, it's him prompting us to be aware of what we're doing is causing suffering. Yeah. Because before, <clears throat> before him being tiny bit aware, awake in us, we wouldn't have had that conscious. We would be like the majority of humanity that's sleepwalking and doing the things um, and not realize and not watching themselves doing doing it. They're not aware that they're doing it. They're just doing it. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we are here kind of our own police people watching ourselves go through the process. Yeah, no, very good. Any other, any other comments? I think Baba agrees because it started to rain. <laughs> ah. Oh, I think it is a little bit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> any, uh, I'll repeat a, a, a something that Darwin and I, and I've done it on these sessions before that Darwin used to say sooner or later you discover your nobody. And that is not an unhappy discovery. <clears throat> but any other, any more? 
Daniel Stone, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, there have been a lot of really um, great themes in this call. One of them that was very early on was about emptiness and fullness. That, um, and when I heard Jeremy speak about, about sort of the trusting in Baba, which I thought that was, it just reminded me of that. And it resonates really with my own experience so, so strongly that, when, you know, I, I do find that, that when I turn to Baba, I'm, you know, my fear inside of me is that, um, that there will be nothing there, <laughs> which is the <laughs> emptiness kind of thing. And, you know, and, you know, and opening myself up to that, to that, to sort of say, well, maybe he will be there. Maybe he will catch me if I'm falling. Maybe he will answer my question. Maybe he will, you know, fill this space in my heart that feels, you know, lonely or aching or what have you. But it's it's that choice about, you know, it, it's about not distracting. And I think the issue of distraction is a very central issue too in my life too, you know, about not distracting myself so that I actually confront that choice and then take the leap into saying, okay, Baba, you, you know, will you be there if I allow you, if I create the space for you to enter into it? And, and to me, that's a really, that to me was a, like a really beautiful theme, um, a resonant theme for me in this, in this uh, conversation we've had tonight. Yeah. Yeah. No, we experienced that early on. That, wow, what if it's all empty? <laughs> <laughs> and Gabriella. Arishta, what you said about um, that we are really blessed that we are a little bit, even a drop aware of um, that we are not even here, that we are watching ourselves, that Baba is real and we are false. It had a moment of terror or memory, had a memory of terror when you said that of being very... Um, terrified that I would lose that drop and an awareness that such preciousness of having come to Baba and and having that consciousness awakened me it was as if I had a memory of many times that I did not have it or something and I don't want to fall back into it uh, and it reminded me of um, an experience when I was in the hospital after my accident and I was just saying Baba's name ferociously. I wouldn't stop. I was so afraid that I might forget to say his name. And um, a member, a good, a beautiful member of our community was visiting with me at the hospital. And she said, Gabriella, you need to calm down. Let him remember you for a minute. You know, don't, you can't do it all. Let him remember you. And I could calm down and it was, she was, you know, very old time Baba lover and I, I trusted her, you know, but I think it was that feeling at that moment as if I was in some precipice, but some turning point in my life that maybe I would fall backwards and um, lose that precious drop of consciousness and presence of Baba. So we're so, so blessed to have that and just the awareness of that. Thank you. Very touching, Gabriel. Thank you. That's all the hands. Maybe a moment of silence would be. Yeah, let's have a few moments of silence with Baba. J Baba. J Baba, mm. thank you all for coming and uh, feel free to unmute your mics at will. The uh, mm. formal part of the meeting is over. Mm. I, I, I was kind of, Mention, I guess, uh, I guess the um, Daniel's in here anymore, but there was a time when and you may, many of you may know this, that Baba was going to push Muhammad the must from the third plane to the fifth plane. And he did not want to, didn't want Baba to do this because we don't want to leave the familiar <laughs> or the unknown. Even if the unknown is greater, Bob was going to push him from the. And and we're in the same boat. We don't we, we, don't, we don't want to leave the familiar heart that where we live in the heart for the soul, which is kind of 
unknown until we know a little bit more about it, until we get a little bit more experience over there. It's hard to just let go of the heart and go to the soul. You know, that's, there's, there's a, there's one part of us that's, that can be a little reluctant to do that. That might be the source of fear <laughs> uh, in us is losing uh, the known and taking a, a leap into the unknown, even though they all say it's magnificent on the other side. <laughs> but we have to get some experience of the other side, even if it's momentary, some brief experience, so we feel a little more encouraged to take a leap. Now the Mandalay, I thought about the Mandalay there. Uh, when I used to go swimming in high school, there were people that were jumping off a 50 foot board mm. and, I, and, and they survived. And so seeing that they were doing it, I would feel more encouraged to do it myself. Well, the Mandalay, I just felt like they, they were jumping off the 50 foot board and we saw like proof that you can survive when you totally let go, you know, to the unknown, to Baba. And I, I felt like they, they let go and look at how magnificent human beings they were. They were, they were the best. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, there are times where you know, I might do something. And then I say to myself, this Baba would not approve of this. You know, and I start to get down a little, but then I remember Baba's compassion, Baba's understanding of our sangscaric makeup and how Baba wants us to give everything to him, the good and the bad. Now, I'm not sure I know how to give Baba the bad in me, but at least I'm beginning to remember that. And uh, hopefully it'll lead to, you know, maybe stopping the action sooner or, or being able to to Baba more. So that's some of the things I am beginning to keep in mind now more. Yeah, excellent. There's a line that um, Bob is where he says, everything is my will. And if you do not do my wish, that is my will also. I don't know if you, I'll say it again. Everything is my will. And if you do not do my wish, that is my will also. So he covers everything. Thank God. <laughs> and, and that would apply, Cindy, now to everyone else's, whatever yeah. they're doing, yeah. is his will too. Yeah. Even if it's not my wish. Yeah. And Jeff, that quote's from Lord Mayer, yes? You know, Al Grasso located that quote, and I don't know where he got it. And I don't no, know. I almost guarantee it's in Lord Mayhair, yeah. What's that? I, can, I almost guarantee it's in Lord Mayhair. I remember reading it, and I was blown away. I was like, thank God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty sure it's in Lord Mayhair. Yeah. It's all happening within Baba's jurisdiction, you might say. The good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, I found that passage about true valuation, if anybody's interested. Okay. Shall I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it's um, sixth edition, revised edition in volume three. I'm mm -hmm. reading for page uh, 144. So I'm reading the end of one paragraph into a second. So on the whole, mistakes in valuation... Um, sorry, mistakes on valuation are far more effective in misguiding, perverting, and limiting life than mistakes in purely intellectual judgments about certain objective facts. Mistakes in valuation rise owing to the influence of sub subjective desires or wants. True values, italicized, are values which belong to things in their own right. They are intrinsic. And because they are intrinsic, they are absolute and permanent and are not liable to change from time to time or from person to person. False values are derived from desires or wants. That's also in Italian. 
they are dependent upon subjective factors. And being dependent upon subjective factors, they are relative and impermanent and are liable to change from time to time and from person to person. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful quote, and that goes right along with, 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 uh, with the effort and grace. <clears throat> yeah, the, there are these truths, and then they, these, there are these higher truths that are intrinsic, and they get reflected in our heart. And if we live by them, we draw closer and closer <laughs> into, into the divine, for sure. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's Adrian. Yeah, okay, good. Hey, I, I listened to your concert for a good bit, and then I had to uh, um, do some other things, but thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And if you have a, a, a song at, a, in a little bit, you're more than welcome, but you did <laughs> sing already, and you might be worn out. I, I got a little worn out. It was pretty intense. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I was going to ask you, Jeff, I just, yeah. I don't know why, but I just suddenly, suddenly kind of popped up within me just to, um, if you could share, I don't know, just maybe a moment that um, you had with one of the Mondali, or maybe just being at Baba's home in India, and just something that springs up when I ask the question. Uh-huh, some exchange. I think I told you the one thing, the inner exchange I had with Erich uh, when I was young, but I, that might bear repeating uh, <clears throat> because not everybody heard it, but <clears throat> this was back in the 70s, and um, I said to Erich um, in, in Mondale Hall, what if I went out last night <clears throat> to a party and I got drunk and had a wild time <clears throat> and I carried on and I knew Baba wouldn't be happy with it, <clears throat> but I did it anyway. And this morning, I'm hungover. I feel miserable. I've got a headache. I said to Eric, I'm willing to suffer the consequences of what I did because that was, I, I did that <clears throat> of my own uh, volition. Does Baba want me to give him my hangover? And Erich said, yes, give him your hangover and the embarrassment of having such a meager gift to give your beloved will inspire you next time to have something more precious to offer him. But always give to him whatever you're feeling deep down. And I said to Erich, but still, isn't that a burden to Baba? And Erich said, brother, it is a greater burden to Baba to withhold anything from him than th to throw on him the worst of yourself. That was emblazoned on my heart. It is a greater burden to Baba to withhold anything from him than to throw on him the worst of yourself. <clears throat> so we are going to do things that... We're a mixture of love and selfishness and, and all the degrees in between. And we're going to do selfish things. And er Erich is saying, share those selfish things with Baba. <clears throat> and, you, and after a while, you get a certain companionship because you are giving, you're, he's there. And, you know... <clears throat> Jeff, what do you have to give me? Oh, well, I got, you know, I got that <clears throat> resentment that I'm feeling at work or something. You still got, you're still dealing with that resentment? Yeah, I am. Well, okay, give it to me. And you develop a sense of humor with Baba because you don't have the greatest things always to give. Darwin used to say, you know, we'd all like to give him a, a bouquet of fresh roses, but a lot of times it's just garbage junk, boredom, uninspiration, whatever. He likes all of it. To withhold that from him 
is is a, a burden to him. You know, so that was when I mentioned that already to you, Alan, that that exchange. Yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. Here's another one I, I said to Erich. <clears throat> uh, we all know how Bal Kachuri, uh, Ababa treated Bal Kachuri. You know, he would find fault with him. He, months ago by, he wouldn't speak with him. He'd just ignore him. Hmm. How did Baba, well, how did Baba, how did you, how did Baba relate to you? What was, what was your relationship like? This is in Mondeley Hall. Erich said, Baba was always very good to me. I had self-knowledge. Inside, I thought, Erich, what are you saying? But immediately said, I knew that I was a scoundrel. Mm. And whenever I did anything wrong, I knew. And I would look over at those all-seeing eyes of Baba, and I knew that he knew. So what was there to say? <laughs> <laughs> and he's the least of a scoundrel I've ever met on earth, except Mara. But he he could see his selfishness. He saw it, and he looked over at those all-seeing eyes of Baba's, and Baba saw it. So Baba didn't have to correct him or point it out. He already got it. That's the... That's the... So I... So... I'm, I, so I thought about this, you know, uh, I thought, well, I wouldn't say I was a scoundrel. I'm, I'm kind of basically a decent person. But to that extent, I realize I don't know myself. But it, that, that Darwin, I mean, uh, Erich being a scoundrel didn't affect his self-esteem. You know, he was able to embrace both. Mm. So I started kind of following up my motives. And I, I found for a couple of years after that, I, they were largely selfish. Things that I thought were uh, decent on the up and up. But I still n never have gotten to that stage where I would say I'm a scoundrel. And, and I, I'm yet to discover that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to the extent that Erich did. It, it's not, it's, 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 um, it's the human condition that we want to survive uh, when Baba wants us to surrender. So he's, he's at that, I'm sure. anyway. <clears throat> Anybody else have any exchanges that they had with the Mondali? Because they were very, very revealing. Answers that you wouldn't necessarily expect. A question, Jeff. Um, yeah. It, it, it was when you said about that we all, uh, we all have in, intrinsic to us a higher truth, and that's reflected in our hearts. Yeah. Uh, so, so do you believe that, that everybody has that intrinsic higher truth in them and it's reflected in their hearts, or that we have to get to that? Or yeah. what, I did, that kind of, I was like, wow, that sounds too yeah. good to me. <clears throat> That's one of the rewards of, of expanding the heart. It's not, uh, you have to get there. But when your heart expands, then some of the higher values, the divine qualities start to reflect in the heart. And they start to motivate you. And I mean, the divine qualities are things that we know. Generosity is a divine quality. Humor is a divine quality. Courage is a divine quality. Empathy. These are things they start to flash in the heart and they become much more appealing to live uh, from than the, the, our usual selfish values. 
So it would seem that many of us have some of those divine qualities reflected um, and then the others that are still growing. But yeah. uh, what, do you, my question is more, um, do you believe that every human being has that? Or is that the truth? That every, it's there for every human being? That everyone's born with that? I, that's, I don't know why I'm asking that exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's potentially there for everyone, definitely. But it has to be uncovered. <clears throat> we all, <clears throat> you know, we have the divine in us. So, but uh, our consciousness, we have to allow Baba to move our consciousness from just living a worldly life to starting to focus on the inner life and the expansiveness that can be there. <clears throat> and it is, you know, it, it is. A, sometime I'll, I'll talk about how Darwin uh, taught, uh, uh, not taught, he was very unassuming, but how he, how, this is back in the early 70s, how he kind of guided us into creating inner space in the heart. Sometime I'll, 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 uh, I'll bring that up because <clears throat> this was a novel thing to us as young people. But um, it is possible to create more space in the heart so that some of these higher things can be reflected in there. They're not theories. You kind of see. I'll, I'll tell you the one beautiful thing about being in the Baba uh, community. <clears throat> I mean, that I've benefited and, and uh, you all can benefit in your own lives. <clears throat> but there's these divine qualities. There's always some Baba lover who embodies one of these qualities at a very beautiful level. Someone who is truly generous, you know, like Chitra. And you see the beauty of that. And so your own heart tries to emulate that, you know, rather than being jealous. I mean, it's like a, be it, it's a beautiful quality. And so you are moved to emulate that. So that starts to awaken that in, in you. It, to someone who is really empathetic, you see the beauty of that in your own heart. If you're not that empathetic, it starts to, uh, encourage and inspire you to be more empathetic because you see the beauty of it. It's not just, you know, you should do this. It's not a should. It's, it's, it's intrinsic. It's an intrinsic beauty to it. Or someone who is very, uh, has great courage. Or humor. Humor is a divine quality. Mm. And so we can benefit a lot from each other. When you see some uh, one, see a person may have only one of those divine qualities that they have uh, uh, somehow cultivated from past lives, and 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 you see it. They may be backward in some of the <laughs> other qualities, <laughs> and and uh, you know that's for, for sure. But we can benefit uh, uh, from each other in this way. I, I, I mean, like I say, I have benefited tremendously by uh, being around my fellow Baba lovers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jeff. That's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. And I see it within myself and that it also is an opportunity ways to love those that whom you cannot love, as Baba says. <clears throat> Yeah. You see that divine quality that they do have out of the 10 that they don't, <laughs> or they don't appear to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing that ha helps me is e everybody is Baba in disguise. Mm -hmm. I mean, when that becomes a little more real, uh, then a lot of uh, judgmentalness and criticalness uh, starts to dissolve. Yeah. And I, I had, this is Cindy, I had an experience a few days ago. I was, re I haven't been angry like this in quite a while. 
And so rather than directing it at the person, I just was yelling at Baba. Like, I mean, I gave him way more than just like a hangover. I was like yelling. And, and I, I used to think that was so terrible to get angry at God and to say the things that I might've said to a person if I were to say it, but it dissolves it. Baba takes it then. And yeah. it's almost funny afterwards when yeah. I, after I'm yelling, you know, I mean, obscenities even, like I hate the way you yeah. show up like this and Baba, you, you show up like this. And then at the end, I just kind of left. Yeah, no, I, I tell you, I think Baba thoroughly enjoys our outbursts, you know? Yeah, it was an outburst. Yeah, hey, I, I the thing that I think Baba's not so keen on is indifference. Mm -hmm. you know? But yeah. Okay. I want to say something. Yeah. Um, I really like hearing that, Cindy. Thanks. Uh, because I, I have this, I'm a, a very emotionally, you know, I have a lot of feelings. And I just realized recently, like, I was having some, I don't know, it was like, it was just like some crazy series of emotions, like back to back. And I just kind of, was so rattled and kind of lost my mind and just started like, you know, yelling or crying or something. I was just, you know, ah, all totally got totally messed up and broken down into like a puddle and I couldn't like hold myself up. And I was just looking at this picture of Baba and just like crying. And it, it was so beautifully embarrassing and humiliating. And then I just realized in that moment, he said, sort of like communicated to me, like, I like it when you're like this. And he really like, for me personally, I think just the way that my personality is and the way that I am as a person, I, I, I used to feel really bad about being so emotional. And then I realized that's how Baba designed me because that's how he uses me. He likes it when I'm all a puddle and a mess because then he can just, it's so easy for him at that point to, to connect with me because I'm like I'm I think I must have been really built up in, in a lot of past lives and emotionless because in this life it's like it must be such a joke for him to get to watch me be such a mess and I don't like enjoy that experience necessarily but I I appreciate the the humility that it like puts in me and I like that he accepts me in my, it's just all beautiful to him. It's just like, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing so gross or so embarrassing or so horrific or humiliating that any of us can do that would like push him, that would be, you know, disapproved by him in the highest sense. And I just, it's so impossible for us to imagine because I think most of us struggle with feelings of, just unworthiness and shame. And that's just such a, such a huge core of the human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when he, and when he accepts us in that, it's also very destructive to our ego. He's saying, Oh yeah, I'm not ashamed. You yeah. want to do that? Thing? I'm not ashamed. And then it's like, what, uh, you know, kind of like blows a fuse. Beautiful. No, that's the way to be, I think. <laughs> <Thanks. You know? laughs> because you don't want to let your life experience cause a distance between you and Bob. You know what I mean? Okay, I have a different yeah. emotion. Yeah. What, what about fear? Giving fear to Baba. Does anyone have any advice or experiences? Anybody there? The one thing that I've found for me personally, and I want to hear what everyone else thinks, is that I, I'd never had so much fear as I had in the past couple of years. And I had a bunch of panic attacks, like before, I'd never had panic attacks. And then I'm just like having, pan I had two panic attacks at the Mayor Center on two separate trips. And one of them led me to like throwing up in the, I mean, it was so terrifying. I was just filled with this like intense fear and it, the thing that soothed me and still soothes me when that comes back up is just remembering that B Baba, for whatever reason, beyond my understanding, wants me to go through this. Baba is putting me, putting this fear in me. Baba has awakening that he's, 
and then that quote that I got that first time I had a panic attack at the center and then someone read me this quote, don't get down about what I bring up in you. It's like he's drawing the fear up for whatever reason. And it means that it's okay that I'm afraid. In that, and suddenly when it, when it becomes okay with me that I'm afraid, it reduces my fear experience by like 50%. Right. That's been my, my solution. Yeah, for, beautiful. For me. <laughs> yeah, what, what, I think she's exactly right that he brings the fear up in you so that you can give it to him. So that <sighs> you can gradually be done with it. <laughs> really I, I'd like to say uh, that image of the child who's afraid runs to the mother yeah so Baba's run to me with your fear yeah, yeah. hi it's Marsha I'm going to say something yeah I find that um, Baba says don't give you don't have to give me all your beautiful things because I know these things. I want to know what your weaknesses are. And I feel that's because that's what he wants us to, to work on is what's not right with us. And we're using different people and situations like actually now to reflect off of what we see in other people are these things that are really in ourselves, you know? And talk about fear. Jeff, remember when I got lost in the woods for two and a half hours? And yeah. I was going to be scared and then I called him Baba and he managed to get me back to my cabin by 11 o'clock curfew. <laughs> and I kind of got to the point where I was just had to keep on walking. And I said, well, it could be coyotes out here. And I said, I might have to sleep here. But I wasn't afraid. It was really strange. I knew that he didn't want me, he didn't want to help me and not have somebody rescue me. In fact, I usually get rescued. He made me find my way myself, but I knew he was protecting me. Yeah. I remember that evening. <laughs> <laughs> but then I let that go. You know, like otherwise, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, great to see you too, Marcia. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Chicago. Well, I listened to you two last YouTubes, and I didn't participate, but I went, I went back and took notes and read to catch up, you know, but it's really great that you're doing this. I'm very yeah. happy. Yeah. And, and, these, and these subchapters are like facets of, of a diamond. So it's not like if you miss something earlier that uh, you're, you're, you have to catch up because they're all kind of camera angles <clears throat> on our relationship with Baba, you might say. Hey Jeff, um, this is Laika. I wanted yeah. to say something to Adrian about yeah. her sharing, which is so beautiful. And you're such a beautiful person. <laughs> really enjoyed getting to know you for these Zoom meetings. But um, when you were talking about, you know, melting your meltdowns and all of that, um, it just reminded me of the many, many stories we'd hear from the certain Mondali. He was different with every Mondali according to their sanskaras, but certainly with Erich and Bauji and a lot of the men, um, he would push them and push them and push them and push them and prod them and poke them and you know, well, I mean, we, there's so many stories of him. Are, is he here yet? Is he here? You know, it's just these impossible things until they finally lost their cool and said, yes, mama. Yes, he's coming. I've told you, you know, just totally lost it. And then he would just get all happy and he'd smile and he'd go, you know, <laughs> gotcha. I call them the gotcha stories. And I yeah. think that, that the thing about the gotcha, as I think we've all experienced, is uh, you know, when we're just in complete like uh, meltdown, that is surrender. And sometimes that's the only way we can get there. <laughs> it's messy, you know, but it's, uh, I just remember, like, you know, they said he'd be pushing and pushing and tension and tension. And then when the person would lose it, Baba would get very happy and like a little child and, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> so I think that part of the fear and things that comes into into our emotions a lot of times is our judgment that we shouldn't be feeling them. You know, I shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't be. And like you express, once we go, oh, it's okay for me to like be a mess or to be afraid or to be, then like it is reduced by 50%, you know, it becomes yeah. less of a boogie <clears throat> then, and then we can give it to Baba, you know, we're not just like totally consumed by it. But yeah. I just wanted to, um, it just reminded me of so many stories from the Mondali about their particular meltdowns. Yeah. No, good. 
Oh, I, I also I wanted to um, what, for the lady that asked about the fear, what what helps me sometimes to put me over the top um, when I use it is it's infinitely better to hope for the best than to fear the worst. And sometimes when I remember that and I resonate with it and I just let the energy rise just enough to you know execute whatever I am need to in a moment that's that's when i use it i'll pass yeah yeah very good i mean this is <clears throat> these are some of the major things i feel we have to deal with is uncomfortable emotions and, and what to do with them uh so that they don't throw us into a, a despondency or a heavy mood so we can kind of go on being available to love I mean, this is the, it's a, it's a battle uh, and everybody has a very unique way as, as we hear of, of, of dealing with this stuff, getting, you know, getting back on course. Yeah. Can I ask at yeah. the uni, by the way, Jeff, you and Peter singing Tuesday was beautiful. Thank you. Oh, okay. I saw that. And the man is it the man that sang the song about loving love loving loving like misha i think his name is is he probably. Misha Muse? misha ruttenberg probably yes misha ruttenberg does anyone know that song it's a song i tried to look it up about it was just about when you love loving then there's when you know that's what you love like that's your north star you love loving because when you said that when you're what to do with uncomfortable emotions so we don't so we can be available to loving. Yeah. You know, I don't know if anyone knows that song. No, I don't. Asia um, has many songs up on YouTube. And sometimes if you just Google a lyric, it might come up. He's um, quite prolific. In his yeah, I, I, I tried that today, but you know, love and loving are pretty popular themes and there's like hundreds of them. Yeah, a little gen general. <laughs> yeah. Somebody at Sufism Reoriented could tell you um, okay. I think he's on the Pacific Coast. Yeah, I think so too. California, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other things that come up? Um, yeah, Jeff, I'd like to share one thing. Um, <clears throat> talking to Eric and the guy that just left was talking about trusting Baba. And I remember when I went to India, and I said, you know, Eric, everybody out there is just all the people here, you know, they're out. I was in his room, sitting on the bed, the other bed, looking at him. And everybody loves Baba so much. And Eric, I don't know what's happening, but I'm not feeling. My mind, I'm just not, I'm not feeling like they are. I'm not experiencing what they are. And he let me talk. And then he said to me, okay, well... As for whether Bob is the avatar or not, he is. Just put it on the back burner and let it alone. He said, make friends with your mind. Tell your mind that it has gotten you through your education and you have money and you bought a house and a roof over your head and all the things the mind has done has been so kind and just brought you to where you are today and that it will take you to Meher Baba. And, and that was it for me. Everything lifted. And I oftentimes go back to that idea of making friends with my mind. Yeah, beautiful. And from, you know, here's, a, uh, I'll share this with you, unless someone else has something to mention. Uh, and it, uh, something that happened with uh, Mara <clears throat> back in the mid 70s. You know, I was there at Merizad and, and Mara was saying goodbye to this lady from her porch there. We were kind of down below on the ground below and she was up on the porch. She was saying goodbye to this one lady who was going back uh, to the West. She was finishing her pilgrimage and I was just there. I was just gonna be going back to, uh, you know, back to Merabad. Uh, can you folks hear me? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. And Mara said, you know, 
this, this is, uh, she says, sometimes we feel very empty and I don't remember what the other word was, desolate or whatever, but we know Baba wants us to be cheerful, so we make efforts to be cheerful. So inside I'm thinking, wow, she was next to the source of all love for the decades and decades. And she hasn't kind of mastered the experience of a joyous, warm, full heart that she sometimes feels empty. So I, I said to myself, love must be something different from what I thought. You know, uh, and here's how I took it. it a, a, after that, because I used to, up to that point, I used to feel, when I didn't feel that warmth and fullness in my heart, I must, I, I think, well, what did I do? I did something wrong. I had it earlier than today and now it's gone. I, you know, I'm, well, what did I do with Bob? I lost it. But after that, I never bothered whether I felt empty or depressed or joyous or thing. I saw kind of like the, how we feel, our moods are like the seasons that, that pass by. There's spring, there's summer, there's fall, there's winter. And <clears throat> we're not gonna be able to keep our emotions, our emotional, uh, we're not gonna be able to keep our heart in springtime all the time. It's gonna have to go through the seasons. But, but, we, but love is behind that. We, we can be behind that and let these seasons go by and not get all pulled down into the seasons uh, of our emotions. The, the, the mood. Did, did you follow? That was a pivotal moment, you know, because then after that, I didn't worry about how I felt. How we feel and love are often very different things. You could be you could be totally depressed and risk your life suddenly for someone else. So that risking your life for someone else is not dependent upon your depressed mood that you were in. Love is it comes from a different place. That seeing seeing the difference there made a tremendous uh, 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 impact and has had great meaning in my life. So you're not going to always feel Baba. I mean, someone said to Kitty, do you feel Baba? Uh, Kitty Davy? And she says, oh, no, I haven't felt Baba in years. <laughs> Look at how loving she was. <clears throat> so feelings aren't necessarily a sign of love. Feelings are, what we talked about it last time, feelings are a great vehicle. But, but Love doesn't have to use feelings as a vehicle. <clears throat> the f that must have been a love dog. Yeah, I heard that dog there. Yes, oh, really. love dog. I, I think that song, I looked it up because I have this stuff on my, on my phone. It just disappeared. Is that Mad for Your Love? I have it. If you, I don't know what it sounds like, but I can play a little group of it. If that's what you're looking for. I don't know if it's what you're looking for. Look that up, Mad for Your Love. For him. I don't know. It's, I don't think it is, but I love that song yeah. too. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Mark, just so much. Let me move to. <clears throat> any other, any other? I wanted to um, yeah. talk yeah. about, um, I just often have watched like Padre and the first time I ever saw him, I came across him on YouTube because I typed in Mayor Baba. And then I just saw this video of this wh white haired glass, you know, guy sitting on a porch and talking about, you know, his voice was just so, I don't know, there's something very fiery, very, very burnt. It was just like at the end, you know, I, something, I just felt that from this guy. And then, and then from hearing, hearing him, and the way he was interacting with people. I mean, he was one of the early Monoli, correct? I mean, and he, and there's these young people asking him all these questions and he wasn't afraid. He was not afraid. He was just unabashedly himself to the point where he's like, what kind of stupid question is that? God is, what are you talking about? Next, you know, anyway, but then he would, but it wasn't just bashing because 
like he would say something and then people would get riled up and I could feel it and people would be interactive, with, you know, talk back to him. And then he would say, one time, you know, in the early days of Baba, we would get in little fights. And then he would, it was just like him being himself. I felt like it just, it was, it just was like, it's healing for me to, I don't know, something about it was just like you were talking about Erich. It was like Erich just being himself was so, it just ha had that kind of, that general help for everybody else. And I, I don't know, I just, I, I get that sense yeah. of, it, and we're talking about being, being honest or, or just being ourselves, I think, and, and just, you know, like getting, like I said last week, like taking the boot off your own neck, like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, you know, and I think I, I'm, I'm just starting to see how much I do that all the time, like, I shouldn't do that, or, or I, man, I really messed up, or I'm just so, you know, Baba saw me do this, so he just, you know, it's just, but it's like, you know, he's here now, like, he's not, it's not like he was this, this old guy that died in 1969, you know, like, Baba is just literally uh, every, everything, and so to, to kind of awaken to that slowly is, is dissolving some of the thing of, like, this or that shouldn't happen, and slowly all the events of my life are dissolving into into him so um yeah I just appreciate, yeah appreciate, appreciate everybody sharing no that's that's yeah beautiful <clears throat> yeah the uh here's a little story about padre there was <coughs> one guy um flag chris he used to work out, he, he was living at Maribad and he would go, to, uh, go out to work at Marizad and on the way back into town, he would go to the Sarosh Canteen and have a few beers. And the curfew at Maribad was 9.30. <clears throat> and uh, he kind of got carried away and he realized, wow, he's running late. And Padre is there, you know, uh, as the, the head of Maribad and, you know, kind of a forceful guy. So... He, uh, he's, he gets worried and everything. He takes a rickshaw out, you know, to Maribad. It has the guy park about a half, uh, stop about a half a mile from there. And he goes on foot trying to sneak into Maribad after the curfew. And Padre would sit on the veranda with his, in the chaise lounge with his back to the road, you know. But he kind of had ears behind his head. And, and so... Uh, a flag is trying to slip by and everything, and Padre says, who's there? And, and flag says, uh, nobody. He says, brother, you ain't nobody yet. <laughs> 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 you ain't nobody yet. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, that's, but Padre was a nobody, but boy. A, a striking nobody. <clears throat> so, I might have to, uh, any other, uh, anything else that comes up? Farish Day, I really, oh, is, are you still there? Well, I really like that poem. I'm here, Jeff. Yeah, oh, I mean, your translation, boy. I have become one with Zoom instead of yeah. one with Baba. <laughs> Hey, did, did you folks all hear her uh, uh, Hafiz poem? Raise I your can always hear it again. Ra raise your hand if you, if you did. <laughs> so so uh, very few. So do it again. This is, this is really encapsulates uh, our session here. Should I like post it in the chat box or something? Yeah, that would be good too. Uh, if I can, let's see. Yeah. Well, and I think, Thursday, thank you so much because the, and that line that I got and I wrote down, protection of his vital presence, I think. Is that in the translation? What yeah. you said? Like yeah. that is to protect our attention. Like I know. It's like vital presence. It's really important. No. Is that be too long to go in the chat box? But yeah. Okay. No, but I mean, uh, could, would you read it? Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. 
Okay, let me um, mute people so that because the, the video cuts off. Let's see who else is unmuted. All right, goody goody. Um, the heart is in the heart is the enclosure around his sacred love. The eye is the reflector of his matchless beauty. I will not bow my head to this world or the next. My neck is under the weight of his benediction. You are wishing for the tree of paradise and I am wishing for the friend's presence. Each person's thoughts reach as far as his own efforts permit. The time of Majnun has passed. It is now our turn. Each person is allotted only five days and no more. Who am I to deserve access to the intimate sanctuary of the beloved? The breeze protects and the sanctity of that inner sanctum. Um, here I think uh, the, he's talking about the breeze being so pure and gentle that it, it, it only it can enter this inner sanctum. That's the way I kind of interpret yeah. uh, the breeze, the breeze protecting and veiling the sanctity of the inner sanctum. The kingdom of love and the treasure of happiness and bliss. What I, whatever I have received is due to his will and blessing. What is there to fear if my heart and I are annihilated? What is there to fear if my heart and I are an annihilated? The aim here is the protection of his vital presence. The seed of my eye is never without his presence because he has taken up private residence in this corner. It shouldn't be surprising that I am a sinner the entire world is witness to his purity. The blossoming of each new flower in the garden is the result of the color and fragrance of his speaking. Don't just observe the outer poverty. Hafez's chest is filled with the treasure of his love. Beautiful, really. Alan, you should have uh, you, you should have Adrian put that to music. It, I mean, yeah, put it, put it on the chat, but it would make a very powerful song. <laughs> yeah, I will email it to her because I think it's kind of too long to go on the chat box. So I will, uh, if she really? if I, uh, agrees to do a song for it, I will um, send it to her. Boy, I mean, it's very powerful, deep meaning. Hey, well, I think um, it's time for dinner and wonderful to see all of you folks. And um, till next. Well, next. No. Oh, hey, Shraddha, until till next week, Baba willing, and the world is still here, we'll meet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob. Bob. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a blessing. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay, Bob, and Jeff. Bye-bye.